Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, dear General Consul Wagner, dear German language students. My name is Juliane Kempfield. I'm the director here at Deutsches Haus, and it is my great, great pleasure to welcome you all to our annual literary brunch. We're doing this festival every year. We're doing this brunch every year, and it is an absolute highlight of our season. Um, before we start, I would like to thank our terrific FNL partners, the Austrian Cultural Forum, the Consulate General of Switzerland, the Consulate General of Germany, Deutsches Haus at Columbia University, the German Book Office, Goethe Institute New York, Po Helvetia, and my wonderful colleagues and interns here at Deutsches Haus at NYU. My thanks also go to our amazing festival curator, Tess Lewis, director, Brittany Hazelwood, and chairwoman, Monique Truong. My thanks also go to our sponsors, to BMW of North America, to Tetley for their wonderful tattoos. Look here, <laughs> love and money. Uh, uh, love is fading now, I don't know what that means. We're, we're gonna discuss that later. <laughs> um, now I lost my track. Ah, yeah, especially uh, a big thank you to uh, Ken Sparks from BMW of North America. He's been amazing. But also thanks to Radeberger Beer. You will enjoy, hopefully, their beer later on. And to Elderberry Catering. And did I forget anybody else? No. I'm thrilled that uh, the festival is growing and that we have yet again a wonderful uh, attendance here on this uh, brutal day uh, and very strange day with snow, rain, sunshine, it seems like, like April. So perhaps February is now the cruelest month. We'll, we'll write to T.S. Eliot and, uh, <laughs> and complain. Um, anyway, uh, moving on. Um, we are, of course, especially thrilled that uh, our five uh, German-speaking writers are here today. Monique Schwitters, Jonas Lusha, Matthias Navrat, Mariana Kaponenko, and Anna Weidenholzer. Uh, Navid Kermani, unfortunately, couldn't come. However, we will read his passage here in English, um, so you'll still get a taste for for his work. Love and money is of course the festival motto this year uh, and uh, I was referring to what I have here. Um, I think it's a terrific motto, Tess. Uh, thank you for choosing it and uh, we now know even better what makes the world go round. Uh, not only money, also love. Um, anyway, introductions. First, our wonderful FNL curator, Tess Lewis. Tess Lewis's translations from French and German include works by Peter Handke, Alois Hotschnig, Julia Rabinovich, uh, Melinda Naj Abonji, Pascal Bruckner, and Jean-Luc Benozilio. She has been awarded translation grants from Penn USA and Penn UK, an NEA translation fellowship, a Max Geilinger <coughs> translation grant for her translation of Philippe Jacoté, and most recently the ACF and Y translation prize for her translation of the novel Angel of Oblivion by last year's FNL author Maya Hadalab. Congratulations, that's wonderful. Tess also serves as an advisory editor for the Hudson Review and writes essays on European literature for a number of journals and newspapers, including the new criterion, the Hudson Review, World Literature Today, the American Scholar, and Book Forum. Now moving on to our actors. Uh, we have two of them. Robert Lyons is an actor and voice actor based in New York, though he spent several years in Germany working at theaters such as the Berliner Ensemble and Brandenburger Theater, as well as in German television. He's also a recent graduate of the Shakespeare Theater's Companies no, Shakespeare Theater Company's Academy for Classical Acting. That's a mouthful. I mean, <laughs> what the? <laughs> yes, it's very, very impressive. <laughs> he can be heard voicing commercials for Nike, Trivago. I, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. Trivago. Trivago, thank you. And Lufthansa, I know what that is. As well as documentaries for National Geographic. And he just finished directing his first audiobook, Peter Richter's 8990 which will appear in Germany in March. That sounds interesting. Hmm. Um, Alice, a born and bred Londoner, Alice Alemano, I'm immediately starting with a British accent, you know, just uh, uh, was trained in New York. She has played roles from Shakespeare to new American writing, working in major off-Broadway and off-West 
off West End theaters, fringe festivals, and numerous film roles. She played the leading role of the angel Gabriel in the Drama Desk Awarded and New York Times critics pick The Mysteries at the Flea Theater, directed by Ed Iskandar. For this project, she was working with brand new material written by 48 different playwrights, including David Henry Huang, Jose Rivera, Ellen McLaughlin, and Craig Lucas. Almost there, guys. <laughs> uh, I deleted something. Good. And now, please join me in welcoming Tess Lewis and all our wonderful authors and actors. So thank you uh, very much for coming. Um, it's nice to see familiar faces and also to see some new ones here this afternoon. Um, the, what we'll do is uh, to give you a sense of the writer's work, both in German and in English. They'll read a, a, a few minutes in German, then Robert Elise will read um, a slightly longer passage in English. Um, and so we'll, we'll start with Anna Weidenholzer, one of our Austrian writers. Uh, Anna was born in Linz and lives in Vienna. She studied comparative literature in Vienna and in Wroclaw, Poland. She's published in numerous literary magazines and anthologies and has won a number of awards, including the Alfred Gesswein Prize, the State Grant for Literature, the Reinhard Pressnitz Prize. And in 2012, she was uh, the writer in residence in the city of Kitzbühel. Her debut novel, Der Platz des Hundes, The Place of the Dog, was nominated for the European Festival for Debut Novels in uh, Kiel in 2011. And her second novel, the one we're featuring uh, this year, uh, Der Winter tut den Fischen gut, Winter is Good for Fish, was nominated for the Leipzig Book Fair Prize in Fiction uh, in 2013. I'm also, for each of the passages, I'm going to do a, a brief, just a couple sentences about the book in each book in question to give you a sense, to let you place the passage uh, somewhat. Um, so for Winter Was Good for Fish, there have, and also if your interest is sparked by these readings, please go to the website there. Uh, we have the festival reader with longer excerpts from each of the books. There have been increasing complaints among critics in the US and the UK that there are fewer and fewer characters in f contemporary fiction who are uh, from the working class or from the ranks of the uh, unemployed and destitute. But Anna, with this novel, has beautifully filled that gap. Um, Winter is Good for Fish is a wonderfully and beautifully understated novel, and it portrays a middle-aged woman in Vienna coming to terms with being labeled redundant, both as a widow and as a productive wage earner. And this novel offers an unsentimental view of loneliness, unfulfilled dreams, and the sense of being overwhelmed by life, but it does so with a sly and subtle sense of humor. Um, it is not a depressing book, um, though it sounds like it. And most remarkably, the novel is narrated backwards. We first meet the 40-something Maria Berenberger, who has been unemployed for several years, um, memorizing motivational texts and faking telephone calls on a park bench so that she'll look busy. Her life is gradually and poignantly filled in as the novel progresses. And we learn, among other things, that she worked in a clothing store um, for two decades. She was married for several years to an auto mechanic and Elvis impersonator who was prone to fits of rage. And she had dreamt, she had, or when she was younger, she dreamed of being a singer and once raised a pet frog from a tadpole with unfortunate results. And I think you're going to hear about that uh, this morning, or this, this afternoon. Thank you, Tess. Um, I'm, or we, are going to read chapter 14. It's called Zwischen den Bäumen. Wenn einem das Haustier im Kühlschrank gefriert, ist das eine unangenehme Situation. Von der Bank am Balkon aus kann Maria ihre Beine so ausstrecken, dass sie mit den Füßen bis zum Balkongeländer kommt. Sie trägt die mit Lammfell gefütterten Winterschuhe und streckt Maria die Beine aus, spürt, spürt sie durch die Sohle das Geländer nicht, das sie im Sommer mit den Zehen umklammern kann. An einer Stelle blättert der Lack ab, darunter kommt der Rost hervor. Im Sommer spielt Maria mit ihren Zehen, bis sich ein Stück Lack löst und zu Boden fällt. An sonnigen Wintertagen holt sie vom Wohnzimmer einen Polster, den sie auf die Bank legt, denn die Bank wäre sonst zu kalt, um darauf zu sitzen. An manchen Tagen vergisst Maria den Polster im Freien, dann wird er feucht über Nacht. Unangenehm ist das falsche Wort, denkt sie und zieht ihre Beine an. 
Wenn einem das Haustier im Kühlschrank gefriert, hat man einen Tod zu verantworten. Otto Schachtel ist kein Polster untergelegt. Sie steht auf der Bank, wie sie bis zuletzt im Gemüsefach des Kühlschranks stand. Bis heute Morgen, als Maria den Kühlschrank öffnete und das Eis bemerkte, das sich auf der Rückwand des Kühlschranks gebildet hatte. Maria sieht hinüber zu Otto. Spring doch, sagt sie. Spring doch, bleib nicht sitzen. Aber Otto kann nicht springen. Die Schachtel ist geschlossen. Maria hat sie dorthin gestellt, wo die Sonne nie hinkommt, damit er nicht zu so schnell auftaut. Sie nimmt vorsichtig den Deckel ab. Dann wartet sie. Es ist ein milder Wintertag. Schnee und Eis lösen sich von den Häusern und es tropft. Als würden die Häuser weinen, hat einmal eine gesagt. Pass auf, dass dich das Eis nicht erschlägt. Ich habe regelmäßig für ausreichend Luft zuvor gesorgt, denkt Maria, sein Darm weint leert. Ich habe ihn gut vorbereitet. Ich habe die Schachtel mit Erde gefüllt, eine Schicht Moos und Laub darauf gelegt. Ich habe das Moos und Laub stets feucht gehalten. Feucht, aber nicht nass. Ich habe für ausreichend Luft zuvor gesorgt. Danke. When your house pet freezes to death in the refrigerator, you're faced with an unpleasant situation. Sitting on the bench on the balcony, Maria can stretch out her legs till her feet touch the railing. She is wearing her lambskin lined winter shoes. And when Maria stretches out her legs, she cannot feel the rails, which she can grab with her toes in summer, through the soles. The paint is flaking off in one spot, revealing rust underneath, and in summer, Maria picks at it with her toes till a chip of paint separates and falls to the ground. On sunny winter days, she gets a cushion from the living room and lays it on the bench, because otherwise it would be too cold to sit there. Sometimes Maria forgets the cushion outside and it gets damp overnight. Unpleasant is the wrong word, Maria thinks, and pulls in her legs. When your house pet freezes in the refrigerator, you have to account for a death. There is no cushion under Otto's box. It sits on the bench as it sat until recently in the crisper. Until this morning, when Maria opened the refrigerator and noticed the ice that had formed on the back of the wall of the refrigerator. Maria looks over at Otto. Jump, she says. Come on, jump. Don't just sit there. But Otto cannot jump. The box is closed. Maria has placed the box out of the sun so he would not thaw too quickly. She carefully removes the lid. Then she waits. It is a mild winter day. Snow and ice fall from the houses and everything is dripping. As if the houses were crying, Someone once said, be careful, the ice doesn't kill you. I regularly made sure he had enough air, Maria thinks. His bowels were emptied, I prepared him well, I filled the box with soil, then added a layer of moss and leaves. I always kept the moss and leaves damp, but not wet. I made sure he had enough air. Maria looks over at Otto. She wants to stay seated till the frost has disappeared from the top of his body and the leaves have loosened from his underside. This time he won't twitch when I touch him, Maria thinks and smiles. She runs her finger over Otto without touching him, like she did with the tomcat in the courtyard whenever he came over to the vegetable patch, from his head down over his back, hovering two centimeters above his body. The tomcat liked that, and he would purr with his mouth open. He did not like being touched. Whenever he was touched, the tomcat would flatten his ears against his head and bite down hard on the offending hand. The tomcat was homeless. Walter said, but Isolde put out a bowl of kibble for him every day. The homeless tomcat grew fatter than the cats living in the building, whose ears he would shred if they ever strayed into his territory. Otto's box sits where the tomcat would sometimes try to cross the balcony to get into the kitchen, till Walter threw his slipper at him. <laughs> 